Lord, good morning again, everybody. It's good to see some folks slipping in here along the way. Welcome. Um, girls, that was absolutely beautiful. Thanks for ministering to us this morning. Praise the Lord. Jonathan, you had, you know, right where this, God, this uh, sermon's going, it's headed towards the gospel when we start out in the law. <laughs> so it's good stuff. Uh, but this morning, I want to talk about conscience. The conscience. Uh, uh, every man has a conscience. I think it was John Kelvin that said, God's placed in the heart of man a sense of God. Uh, a sense of God. We know that in, in Romans, it talks about how uh, we can try to repress the truth of God, but that truth just is uh, something we cannot reject or deny. Uh, that in the heart of man, there's a knowledge of God. Uh, we read in Psalm 19 that the heavens declare God's glory, uh, and, and just all of creation shouts God. Um, yet the heart of man as we know from the garden, is bent, bent against God, uh, a bad conscience toward God. So as we look out in our culture and in, in the day that we live in, I think about the, the morals and the, what, what moves people to what's good and, and what's, what's wrong, what, what's, what's evil and, and what is, is, is truth and, and good. And, you know, as a man is in his heart, so he is in the world. Everyone you see, they are who they are from the inside out. Uh, scripture makes that clear. I think a lot of us know that. Uh, and a lot of times it's those actions that declare who we are, uh, what type of person we are. Do we have a good conscience towards God? Do we have a bad conscience towards God? Right here in this portion of Scripture, I think this is... Is, is right front and center when we look at this. And, and of course, if you want to have a good uh, definition of anything, you've got to go to the only inspired dictionary, which is the 1828 Webster's Dictionary. And Webster explains conscience this way, to know, to be privy to, internal or self-knowledge or, uh, uh, or judgment of right and wrong, or the faculty, power, or principle within us which decides on the lawfulness and unlawfulness of our own actions and affections, and instantly improves or condemns, condemns them. And this I found really interesting. The conscience manifests itself in the feeling of obligation we experience, which precedes, attends, and follows our actions. That's a good definition of conscience. So today I want to look at this portion of scripture as Paul is standing before the Sanhedrin in Jerusalem and he professes his complete innocence. We know that he's been wrongly accused. They've tried to kill him in Jerusalem. Those that supposedly have the law wanting to commit murder against him. But Paul, when he stands up before the Sanhedrin, he very confidently says, that I have a good conscience towards God as he stood there that day. So I think it'd be right for us to consider this morning. We're going to see that Paul, in opposition to Ananias the high priest, who I think is a expression of the exact opposite, a man with a bad conscience towards God, a man walking and talking and working evil. But, but the real question is, how do we determine what a good conscience is? What do we even, how do we even gauge that? Uh, I know in our culture, uh, it seems as though there was a time when scripture and, and the Bible was a standard of truth. Uh, not even anymore, even in our courts, as, as we know in our country, murder is allowed um, and, and encouraged. What, what determines what is a good conscience towards God? Uh, you talk to, to, to people, and the hardest thing in talking to them is, in trying to bring truth through the gospel, or, or even what is sin, is that they have no real gauge for what is true and right. What's the difference between right and wrong? It's so muddied, it's so murky. So, so today I really want to look at this idea of having a good conscience towards God. 
So if you'd open up with me in your scriptures, I'm in Acts chapter 22, and I'm going to start reading at verse 30, and I'm going to read through to 2310. You might wonder if you're here for the first time, the Garlands might think, oh my goodness, they just keep reading the scriptures over and over. <laughs> it's the only thing we can count on that is inspired, infallible, uh, and, and sufficient for every uh, part of life here. So open with me to Acts chapter 22, 30. The next day, because he wanted to know for certain why he was accused by the Jews, he released him from his bonds and commanded the chief priests and all the council to appear and brought Paul down and set him before them. <coughs> then Paul, looking earnestly at the council, said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. And the high priest Ananias commanded those who stood by him to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall, for you sit in ju to judge me according to the law, and do you command me to be struck contrary to the law? And those who stood by said, Do you revile God's high priest? Then Paul said, I did not know, brethren, that he was the high priest. For it is written, you shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. But when Paul perceived that one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. Concerning the hope, concerning the hope and resurrection of the dead, I am being judged. And when he had said this, a dissension arose between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. For the Sadducees say there is no resurrection, and no angel or spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. Then there arose a loud cry, and the scribes and the Pharisees' party arose and protested, saying, We find no evil in this man, but if a spirit or an angel is spoken to him, let us not fight against God. Now when there arose a great dissension, the commander, fearing lest Paul might be pulled to pieces by them, commanded the soldiers to go down and take him by force from among them and bring him into the barracks. Mm. This is God's infallible, inspired word, and it is instructive. So as we see here in this little portion of scripture, I think I want to see what is the test of a good conscience? What is the hope for a good conscience? And then a stand of a good conscience. And finally, I want to look, look briefly at liberty of conscience. As we remember in our story, Paul was going to be killed in the temple, but he was saved, as it were, by this Roman com commander, Claudius Lysias. And Claudius Lysias, as Paul put forth his, his free rights as a Roman citizen, has been released. And now Claudius Lysias is trying to get to the bottom of, of all of this commotion. What has Paul done? He knows for one thing he's not going to just kill him out of hand, considering he's Roman. But now he has commanded that you see where the power exists here. The power exists with this Roman uh, uh, commander. He's commanded the Sanhedrin to meet so that he might better understand what's going on with Paul, what type of of sin he's committed where he's at. But right here at the get-go, get we, we see, I want to look at the test of a good conscience. What is the difference between right and wrong? And Paul there earnestly contends before the council, men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. Here as Paul stands before the Sanhedrin, he's declaring his own innocence. And we have this high priest, Ananias, who is standing in judgment above him. He's able to say that day, Paul is with confidence that he has lived in all good conscience. Paul, this is the same Paul who previously was Saul, who persecuted the way to the death. 
But now today, he's able to stand before this Sanhedrin and declare his complete innocence. Not only his own innocence, but that in, in his heart of hearts, he has a good conscience. Because you see, we all know, and we can remember back to, to Acts chapter 9, that Paul, Paul, who once was Saul, has been radically transformed by the gospel. He's been changed and made new. Now to this point, he's unwaveringly able to be right with God and declare his conscience is right. But what's very interesting in this very story, we have a real strong difference playing out between Paul and Ananias the high priest. Paul has this good conscience towards God, but Ananias, I think, is a living example of what a seared conscience looks like, what a hard-hearted conscience looks like. Paul was the Pharisee of the Pharisees, and now Ananias representing the Sadducees. Paul, in some way, must have felt as though he was looking into a mirror when he looked and heard Ananias speak. He must have been remembering back to his previous self, seeing this Ananias just spewing hatred and, 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 and violence, uh, him calling for those, uh, not those soldiers next to Paul. As Paul declares this, he just has them punched right in the mouth. Two men picturing two opposite ways of being. Paul was on that very path, headed down the road to destruction, and Christ, as it were, picked him up out of that very desperate spot. But here we see Ananias in a, a completely different spot. If we look, Jewish historian Josephus gives us a little bit of a background of Ananias. Ananias was a high priest. He was very wealthy. He was insolent. He was cruel, and he was greedy. I think everything Paul, in his heart of hearts, used to be, but he has been completely changed. He was collaborating with, his, with the Romans to, to, to persecute his own people. He was using his status as high priest, working with the Jews for his own personal gain. He ends up being assassinated in 66 AD at the hands of his own people. But we see two men so divergent from each other, and I think it's just that stark when you look at the heart of man. There, there's no kind of middle ground. There's, there's those that can have a good conscience towards God, those that are in right standing with God, that know what is right and live according to what is right, and then we've got Ananias, the complete opposite. And see, the thing is, they're in a Jewish Sanhedrin or council, and this is where the law is actually being meted out. Ananias stands for the law there. And what does he do? He completely rebuffs and disobeys the law and again has Paul punched in the face, in the mouth, without any real judgment being meted out. I mean, law and justice has left Jerusalem by this time. This is not the Jerusalem of the Old Testament. This is not a Sanhedrin that's really standing for truth. And again, we go back to Webster's to look at what does a seared conscience look like? It's burnt on the surface, cauterized, hardened. There's an ins insensibility to it, that seared consciousness. Ananias and Paul, I think, stand as two different ways of being before God. Hard-hearted, contrary to God, soft-hearted, and sensitive to God. So, so today we'll see only that there are these two ways. I've said it a thousand times. Ananias might be the, the, the most cruel example of a hard-hearted, fallen, lawless uh, man that's supposed to represent uh, lawfulness, but is completely filled with greed, and Paul so changed that he has such confidence towards God that he can say, I am in good conscience with God till this very day. Uh, and you see it, and boy, oh boy, do we ever see it nowadays that we live in a world that's filled with greed. Uh, this man here, supposedly representing the council in Jerusalem as the high priest, uh, was as evil and wicked as they come, selling his own nation for money. 
Uh, I dare not stumble into politics, but we can see that this kind of man is still existing today. Those that would give up their country for, for some money. Uh, but, but, but really the point here, though, is because is I want us to think of ourselves. I want us to think about who are we in our heart of hearts and what is the test of a good conscience towards God? What is the test? How do we judge that? Um, everyone, I think today, uh, then you started to see in Jerusalem, those that had rejected Christ, uh, they were living in a very lawless way. It reminds me of the time of the judges, when everything, everybody did what was right in their own eyes, and there was complete lawlessness. There was no conscience of right or wrong. And interestingly, it says, everyone did what was right in their own eyes because there was no king. <laughs> Listen, there's now a king, and he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he's made a way so that there might be right law placed back into the heart of man. Uh, but I get off a little bit. But we live in a culture where right and wrong are like a wax nose. We can bend it any which way we like. Um, and it's so sad. You can't even have a conversation anymore with someone who holds a divergent opinion. Uh, I, I told uh, uh, Rob that I need to interview someone for my, for my uh, missions class, and I need to hear their worldview. And one of my, uh, my cousins reached out to Michelle on Facebook, and he said the worst evil in the whole wide world that the world suffers under is Christianity. That's the evil that the world suffers under. So I thought this young man would be a perfect person for me to hear his worldview. I, I reached out to him. I said, let's talk. I want to know what exactly makes you, makes you tick. What is your worldview? What is right? What is wrong? Where is your conscience? And because that's what it comes down to it. But how do we test a, con a, a worldview? How do we test what is right and what is wrong? Paul, in his, uh, uh, after he's punched in the mouth, Paul lays out pretty clearly exactly where a good conscience comes from and what the real test is. God will strike you, you whitewashed wall. God will judge you, you hypocrite. You should know better. You sit to judge me according to God's law? How can you judge rightly when you've, you're, you're, you're having me punched against the law? So right in that statement, we know what the, the, what, what the, the test of true uh, conscience and what is right and wrong, it's like it's always been. It's God. God created man in his own image back in the garden. And you know what? My cousin, every person in this country that reviles God, every person ever born, they are liable to their creator. They answer to God. And whether they know it or not, they answer, answer to God's word. Right judgment uh, comes from God alone. God is the test of good conscience, and God is the test of bad conscience. Scarier than that, God is the judge who will judge rightly. Samuel Rutherford, just as an aside, has a wonderful book that I'd encourage you to read. Is the ruler king or is the law king? God said, I've, I've, I've honored my very word above my own name. The law is king. God's law is king. God's word is the standard. So Paul is called to, to be respectful to Ananias. How can you revile the high priest? He's the high priest of your people. Listen, it's right to honor those in authority. But when those in authority are completely adverse, 180 degrees opposed to what is right, I think Paul called it the way it was. That you're a hypocrite, buddy. And I think he, he, he probably at that point said, oh, I didn't know he was a high priest. Well, I couldn't tell by the way he's acting. That's for sure. But, but the thing here is that, that we ought to obey God rather than man. Paul, you see such a difference in the way when Jesus laid his life down, the Sanhedrin that judged him, that ended up turning him over to the Romans, that he might lay his life down. It's completely different to the way Peter and John and now Paul react 
to wrong leaders and wrong justice and law, they're disobeying it. But they're also calling people to repentance and where to look. The whole point now is not for them to lay their lives down, but to declare the gospel. So I think pretty clearly, what's the test of a good conscience? It's God himself who we all answer to, and it is God's word, God's law. Uh, I think about uh, Paul standing there in opposition to Ananias, and I, I can't help but think of the Reformation, and to think of, of the father of the Reformation, Luther, and his standoff with Pope Leo X. It, it's a bit, there's some similarities there. Paul was standing on the word of God alone, and so did Luther, whose famous words before Emperor Charles V are instructional at the Diet of Worms on uh, January 23rd, 1521. Unless I am convinced by the testimony of Scripture or by clear reason, for I do not trust either the Pope or in councils alone, since it is well known that they have often erred and contradicted themselves, I am bound by Scripture. I have quoted, and my conscience is captive, where? To the word of God. I cannot and will not recant anything since it's neither safe nor right to go against conscience. I cannot do otherwise. Here I stand. May God help me. Amen. So what is the guide for Paul's conscience now? It's the word of God. God's give, put the word of God in his own heart, given Paul a new soft heart. Uh, it says that the heart of the word of God is written on the heart of the believer. Uh, so, so, so here we have the test, of course, is the law and the word of God. So what is the hope of, the, of a good conscience? We know what the test is. We know God is the judge. But what's the hope? So there's law, right? We've got law. You always compare law with gospel. Johnny said we can't keep that apart from the gospel. So Paul very clearly here points to the hope. For the hope of a good conscience is the gospel. Paul recognizes that the council was composed of Sadducees, which were an aristocratic elite who were not Bible guys. They, they, they didn't adhere to the Old Testament. And you had the Pharisees, like himself, were the Bible teachers of that time. Uh, and he says uh, that because of that, he says, he made men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee, concerning the hope in the resurrection of the dead, here I'm being judged. So Paul really is being judged because he's been preaching the gospel. Paul's being judged because he's been bringing forth the hope that all of the Old Testament pointed to, that pointed to Christ, as he's been preaching everywhere he goes. The one thing those there in the council can't stand is the, the gospel. It's very clear the wages of sin is death. Uh, I, I, on the day you eat of that fruit of the tree, you shall surely die. We know that. We know that we are all lost and in, 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 uh, contrary to God and, and under his wrath. But the whole gospel and the whole Acts of the Apostles has been about preaching this new way, a way of reconciliation, a way that we might be redeemed and made right with God. Concerning hope and resurrection of the dead, I am being judged. The answer is that because of sin, we all die. Because of the good news, we are all able to have hope. Because of sin, we all deserve death and eternal death. But because of the gospel, we have the hope of forgiveness, the hope of resurrection, the hope of new life. I think of Paul, uh, excuse me, Peter, when he stood up against that first Sanhedrin, he said, we ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered by hanging on a tree. Him, God has exalted to his right hand to be prince and savior, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses to these things. And so also the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey. You see, though Paul knew the audience he was preaching to, the audience he was talking to, you had those aristocratic Sadducees because they had no clue about what Scripture talked about. 
They didn't believe in the hope that would come. They didn't even believe there was a resurrection of the dead. One of the greatest lies is to tell someone, you can live however you want, because there is no resurrection. There is no hope after this life. So, so just eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. But Paul knew his brothers there, the Pharisees, that they had a much better understanding of Scripture. They knew that there was hope, that there was resurrection of the dead, that there even was a great spirit that came to those who trusted who would receive the holy spirit so as they're hearing peter talk there there's the rub there's the dividing line between hope for a good conscience towards god and those that have no hope and are destined for only a bad conscience who reject the scriptures out of hand the gospel is such that those who trust can now like christ has been risen from the dead we can be risen from the dead. We can have hope, not just hope of eternal life, but hope of a good conscience now. Hope that we might live according to God's ways. And I'll get back to what we quoted there in Deuteronomy. But now through Christ, is there hope for a good conscience? There's not just hope. There's a surety that we can now have a right and good conscience that we can be in a right relationship to God. Why? The grave is empty. Why? Because Jesus is the right at the right hand of the Father. Paul is a witness to this. He had the privilege of seeing the resurrected Christ. And this is where things get kaflui, of course. Uh, you have those Pharisees that are, that are, are beginning to, to really resonate with what Paul is saying, and you have the Sadducees that are committed to their way of thinking, which is hopeless. So is the dividing line today. We are all born dead in sin, without a heart for God. But when we repent by His grace, we receive a new soft heart towards God, a good conscience, which Paul boasts of there that day and before the Sanhedrin. And, and that's where it is today, so as we live in this polarized uh, situation where, where it couldn't be any, any more stark than guys who believe there is no resurrection and, and, and no hope at all and no spirit at all, and then those that, that see there is hope. Today we live in a culture where there are those that have completely and utterly rejected the word of God and rejected Christ out of hand. Not only that, but we live in a culture very much like there in Jerusalem. You're not even allowed to disagree or bring up this answer as a solution. We have a young guy who's in his early 30s who wouldn't talk to me. I can tell you why he didn't talk to me. Because his worldview doesn't have an answer. Their answer is to quiet us and to try to snuff out the gospel. And that's where we, like Paul and Peter and John, ought to obey God rather than man. Yes. We've got to press it, and we've got to bring the only hope of a good conscience, which is the gospel. We need to be like the great reformer Martin Luther. He uh, wrote, if you want to read, concerning Christian liberty that he wrote just prior to all the trouble he got into up there in Worms, uh, he writes a beautiful letter to the Pope himself, very respectful and, and very much hoping that the Pope would repent and turn from his sin. But, but, but Martin Luther lays it out really clearly what the hope of a good conscience looks like. One thing and one alone is necessary for life, justification and Christian liberty. And that is the most holy word of God, the gospel of Christ, as he says, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me shall not die, but have eternal life. For if the Son shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Father. Our brother Luther, he got it right. And, and Noah Webster, who's also a brother, would describe someone in a right condition with a good conscience towards God who has been transformed by the gospel this way, as conscientious. 
influenced by conscience, governed by a strict regard to the dictates of conscience, or by the known or supposed rules of right and wrong as a conscientious judge. There is no right or wrong apart from the gospel. There is no right or wrong apart from the word of God, which is truth, and which de determines what is right and what is wrong. You see, apart from the gospel, we could never have a right conscience towards God, and we could never be conscientious. There's a lot of folks in our culture that are very conscientious about an evil way of living. They're committed to that. Their conscience is, 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 is so committed that they're willing to do whatever it takes to push this, this evil way on everybody else. They don't have a shot until they come to repentance. So we must be those that stand up for the truth of the gospel. God and his word are the only standard and repentance from sin and trust in Christ is the only way to live truly conscientious lives towards God. Only one way. Now, there's got to be a side door somewhere. There's got to be maybe something else. We live in a pluralistic society, right? I mean, you're going to go and preach to the Muslims. So we'll put their law and what Muhammad said on a level with scripture. Of course not. We're going to come to them in love and try to make a connection. But we're not going to compromise when we preach the gospel. We're not going to set Muhammad up as an apostle like Paul or Peter. And Christ is Lord and God. I don't know what Allah is, but he's not the God of the Bible. So we've got to bring the gospel to those folks. Salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, espoused by the Father of the Reformation. The result is the reception of a good conscience. So we know that there's law. We know what is right. God is the, uh, is the living law. He's made a way through the gospel that we might be forgiven and have a right constant conscience. But now something's interesting, and that you still have your, your scriptures open there. Look at verse 9. We, uh, these Pharisees now say, We find no evil in this man, but if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him, let us not fight against God. You see, we as men have been at war with God ever since Adam. That's right. But now God has made a way, war is over. That the fighting has ended. That now we can be in right relationship with God. We now can have God's word written on our hearts. We're no longer against God. But I look out at the church, I even look at my own life, and I look at, and maybe some of us, as you look back at your Christian life, and you think, I knew law, I, I trusted Christ, but, but I still find myself at times at odds with God and with his law. James, I repented and trusted Jesus. Did that a long time ago. I say yes, Wonderful. But today, are we walking on our salvation? Today, are we as confident about our conscience towards God as Paul was that day before the Sanhedrin? Are you constantly renewing your mind according to God's word? Are you working out your salvation with fear and trembling? Are you as confident, I say again, that I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day? today. Christian, you have put a confidence and trust in Christ. Are you walking it out? Are you living and, and walking in right standard with God? I know myself walking with the Lord since I was 18, that was always kind of an up and down road there. There were times where I was walking in faith and, and, and seemingly uh, doing what was right, and then there's other times where I find myself falling away and and doing what is wrong. We live in a culture that is bent on evil. We live in a culture that we're exposed to sin and temptation everywhere we turn. Young Christians, whether you turn on your, your device, your internet, your Twitter feed, Facebook, there is evil everywhere. TV. So, so are we living 
faithfully? Can we have confidence towards God that our, our conscience is right? It's true that, that, that we have forgiveness with God, that the gospel now has made us right with the Father, but we're called to a higher way of living. We're called to look differently from the world. How are we going to share the gospel to a world that's headlong, running towards hell, and enjoying sin day in and day out, and we don't look any different than they do? We should look starkly different from them. The same Paul who confidently declared that his conscience was right also said this, For I delight in the law of God according to my inward man, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is also in my members. We, as Christians, I think you'd have to admit, seem to be in a never-ending battle for a good conscience, that we might keep a good conscience towards God, that we might be obedient to God as we walk out our faith. Never happened to me. I've been on the right and straight and narrow ever since I trusted the Lord. Who can say that? <laughs> Never fell into sin. No struggles ever. Of course not. We all struggle. We all struggle terribly. The, 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 when you hear that scripture about the Son of God setting you free, you have to look at just before that. Most assuredly, Jesus said, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Then he says, therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. No, well, I'm free to go to heaven. I'm free to be forgiven. I'm free to be right with God. No, no, no. Much more importantly, we are free from sin. We're free to live upright lives day in and day out. We don't have to live according to the ways of the world. We don't have to live with, with, with hidden sin in our lives. I'm not talking about John Wesley's perfectionism. I'm talking about a good, upstanding uh, word of God that changes you in a Holy Spirit that makes you able to overcome sin and not be enslaved to it. The kind of power that the Son of God enacts in the heart of the believer. You see, that's going to make a big difference. You know, if I were to share the gospel, but that, and you hear it, you see all the time with pastors that fall. Or, or you see it with Christians, dads that were Christians that, that fall, and their whole families fall after them. And I guess all I'm saying is we look at law and we look at gospel, I just want to challenge us that let's not fall into the little sins. Because the little sins turn into the big sins that end up destroying us. A house either built on the rock or a house built on the sand. Those of us that built our house on Christ will not fall. We may stumble, but we're going to continually overcome. So I know people who started out good and have fallen. I know people who were so excited about the gospel that I looked up to them and said, my goodness, those are some serious Christians. They fell into such wicked and horrible sin that it just tore their families apart. And God forbid where they will end up. So is there hope, though? I think there's hope. Anybody like casting crowns? If I can bring a Christian rock band <laughs> into this very somber moment. Casting Crowns is one of my favorite. Um, and, and they have this song. And, and how sin happens is it's, it's very crafty, kind of like the devil. Kind of just, just kind of, you know, lies to you. And it's very slow. And they've got this song called Slow Fade When You Give Yourself Away. It's a slow fade when black and white have turned to gray. Thoughts invade, choices are made, a price will be paid when you give yourself away. People never crumble in a day. It's a slow fade. It's a slow fade. That's how it happens. It's, it's very crafty. And I just want to challenge us this morning. That doesn't have to be our portion. 
If we've struggled with some sort of sin that we're into, Christ is still that same powerful, resurrected Savior who can deliver us from our sins, forgive us, deliver us, and make us able to stand. Amen. Casting Crowns quotes that, that you know, little kid song, Be careful, little eyes, what you see. It's the second glance that ties your hands as darkness pulls the strings. Be careful, little feet, where you go, for it's the little feet behind you that are sure to follow. Yes. Sin is so conniving and subtle, the subtleties of sin. So we've got to be careful. No, no, I can watch that movie. I'm okay. No, no, no. When that pops up on my Twitter feed, I might have glanced at it, but I'm all right. No, I'll just go once. I'll just go look at it once. I'll be fine. I'll repent later. And that's how it starts. And it's a slow fade. Be careful, little eyes, what you see. And, and Jesus says, a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Is there hope? Well, there is hope. Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. But the stark warning casting crowns the journey from your mind to your hands is shorter than your thinking. Be careful if, it, if you think you stand, you just might be sinking. Sounds pretty impossible. It is. With man, it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. We can not only be forgiven and made right with God, but he calls us to what we're talking there in Deuteronomy, how we now can live, how now the moral law of God can be a direction for us. Character, folks, just a couple things, is determined by what we do while we're alone. So if being alone is a problem, look to find someone to be accountable. With great freedom comes great responsibility. We've been set free, but now we are responsible to obey and to follow everything that Jesus teaches us. Christians must be people of conviction. Let me quote one more scripture here. Hebrews 4, 11 to 13 says this, Let us therefore be diligent to enter the, that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him with whom we have to give an account. The law, of course, was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, but now God's law word will be our guide as we walk out who we are as new creations in Christ. And that's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Again, Webster's 28 describes the overcoming Christian this way, that we are a, scru a scrupulous uh, regard of conscience and a sense of justice, a strict conformity to its dictates. Listen, I'm not saying it's salvation by works. Of course it isn't. But because of our salvation, we're going to live a certain way. We're going to walk a certain way. Now when Jonathan says what he says, we who are Christians, who are the new Israel, we can say, and now Israel, what does the Lord require of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all of his ways, and to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul. That's only possible because of Christ. And to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command you today for your good. Indeed, heaven and the highest heaven belong to the Lord your God. Oh, we're all Christians in heaven. But he's also the Lord of the earth. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we're called to a different way of living we're called to live rightly. And I think I'll save my last point for next week. I've said more than I should have said. Let's come up and sing our last song responsibly. But I just want you to do this. I think 
We've looked at what a good conscience looks like, looks at like. We've looked at the hope of a good conscience. But I think more importantly, a good conscience is played out in how we live. That good conscience, those things in our heart, are going to translate into a changed life, a life living rightly before God. This is a high calling for the Christian to walk consistently to be true witnesses day by day, examples of the resurrected Christ. That's what resurrection life looks like. And it's wonderful. You can play with sin. Sin seems fun for a little while. Let me tell you what, the end is not good. <laughs> the end is not good now, and the end is not good when Jesus judges. Let's pray. Father, we thank you today for the power of the gospel. We thank you, Lord, that we were lost and without hope. We were without hope and, and, and contrary to you. Our heart and our mind and our conscience was set against you, Father. But that, Lord God, you have given us new hearts, fleshy hearts. You, Lord God, have written your law on our hearts. So, Father, I pray. I pray that you might forgive us, Lord God, where we have missed it where we take you for granted, where even we presumptuously sin in certain areas, God, have mercy on us and help us overcome in those areas that we might walk and live a life worthy of the Savior who has delivered us. That then, God, we might also bring this message of reconciliation to a world that is being destroyed by their sinful lives. Father, we thank you for your goodness and your mercy. Pray, Father, that you might seal your word in our hearts and make us able to obey, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.